Welcome back to Remote Connect, everybody. I'm Nadia Vatalidis, VP of People at Remote, and I get to talk to you today all the way from sunny Johannesburg, South Africa, and my home base. We are surrounded by beautiful views today, and you might be able to spot a giraffe or zebra behind me today. I'm incredibly excited about sharing the stage for the next 30 minutes with a very aspirational woman, but also probably the most important voice in the world of work right now. What makes this guest so special to us at Remote is her inspiring advocacy, not only for finding better ways to work, but also for inspiring leaders and their teams to just become better people. You all know Ariana Huffington, Ariana was the original founder and CEO of Huffington Post, a global publishing powerhouse with great success. But recently, Ariana is actually the founder and CEO of Thrive Global. You're welcome to check out thriveglobal.com for great inspiration and motivation or follow them on social media for daily motivation. What the mission of Thrive Global is something we could all get behind. It's to end the delusion that burnout is the only way to have success at work. Ariana is here to help us untangle and share great strategies and practical ideas that we can use daily to start building a better way to work and live. Why don't you join me in the studio right now? And here we are. Welcome, Ariana, to Remote Connect. We are absolutely thrilled in having you in the session today. First of all, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Thank you so much, Nadia. It's great to be with you. And I love the fact that uh, you are married to a fellow Greek. <laughs> so we have a lot to talk about. I'm feeling um, really good today. I'm out in Los Angeles where uh, I brought up my two daughters. I normally live in New York. It's a beautiful day. Um, I had some great meetings with our Thrive team. So I know that um, the pandemic era has been a roller coaster for us. So we have good days and bad days, but today has been a good day and I'm looking forward to our conversation. That's amazing. That's great to hear. And I hope it's been sunny in Los Angeles. Other than I know it's been very cold in New York City. So glad to hear you're in a slightly warmer location right now. I, you know, I do care about your well-being, which is why I asked you that question. But I also learned this question from you, which is one of the most important voices at work right now. So tell me a little bit about why is this question so important and why employee well-being is so important right now? So what we are finding out during these two years or more than two years of um, working largely remote uh, or in a hybrid world, even though you were ahead of the curve with remote work, what we found is that we have to be more deliberate uh, creating connections, intimacy, and um, belonging. I know belonging is very important for remote, and it's harder um, when we are all dispersed and distributed. So making sure that conversations start with something more personal instead of jumping directly into what's happening at work or what the the work conversation is going to be is is pretty key and and that's why not only in general daily conversations but also when a new um, employee is being onboarded we like to have the manager do what we call an entry interview and make the first question of the entry interview be, what's important to you outside of work and how can we support you? And that allows people to bring their whole selves to work and to have cultural permission um, to engage uh, with every part of themselves and not just their um, what they're doing at work. Yeah, I absolutely love that. It also builds such great social connection, especially, you know, at times where we can't be together, 
or we're in remote distributed teams or hybrid environments. So I absolutely love that. Next up and leading straight from this conversation, a lot of organizations are implementing wellness and mental health programs, but the accessibility of those programs is often a problem, right? So if they're not, if they're not making time and space available for their employees to actually access those coaches or therapists, that can have a devastating side effect. What are your thoughts on creating these wellness and mental health programs? So at Thrive, we believe it's really important to bring uh, support for employees' well-being um, in the workflow, to literally embed it in the workflow. Um, and that's why we recognize that while people may be overwhelmed at the moment, and even if you offer them a solution that's for their well-being, it may seem like one more thing to do. Um, if you break it down into micro steps, what BJ Fogg at Stanford calls tiny habits, then these micro steps embedded in the workflow build healthy habits and that begins to change how we show up both at work and in our lives. And I thrive with hundreds of micro steps, Nadia. And just to give you an example, how we start our day makes a difference. And 72% of us start our day by jumping to our phones before we are even fully awake. So a micro step is to take 60 seconds before you go to your phone in the morning to set your intention for the day, to take some deep breaths, um, to remember what you are grateful for, any aspect of that. And what that does is it helps us to prevent the stress cycle that begins when we immediately go to our phone and maybe we come across, read something that stresses us, upsets us before we are ready. And it's only a minute. And I think we can all agree, if we don't have a minute, we don't have a life. Another micro step I love is based on habit stacking. Anytime we are doing something that doesn't require our minds and our brains, like washing our hands or washing the dishes or um, uh, brushing our teeth, to use that moment to habit start a gratitude practice. Because a lot of neuroscience tells us that gratitude is not coexisting with anxiety and worry. So anytime we focus on what you're grateful for, we bring more joy in our lives and, and uh, less worry. Yeah, I've seen such amazing gratitude posts on your Instagram feed as well as on your Twitter feed. And that certainly resonates so much with me. Um, as a follow up advice from you, I can imagine it's really difficult to find a crucial balance between being vulnerable, but also resilient in the workplace. What are your thoughts on that? Especially you mentioned, you know, showing up as your full self at work. But tell me a bit about that balance between vulnerability and resilience. So actually being vulnerable uh, makes it easier to be resilient because uh, when we are not vulnerable, um, maybe we are hiding something um, that we are concerned about. And anytime we are hiding something, uh, anytime feel, we feel we cannot show up like our full selves, it's affecting our ability to deal with challenges, which is at the heart of resilience. Nadia, we know that everybody's been going through challenges, but people have been responding very differently. Yeah. And uh, as parents, we want our children to be resilient. We want them to be able to deal with what else our life, their lives bring to them. And the same applies at work and in every aspect of our lives. And resilience has always been important, but since the pandemic, 
when uncertainty and anxiety um, have increased, resilience has become more important than ever. And I see it a little bit like, what do we need to do? What practices do we need to bring into our lives to make it more likely that whatever happens, we can be in the eye of the hurricane rather than in the hurricane itself? That's amazing advice. Thanks so much for sharing. And yes, everyone experienced the pandemic in such a different way, right? So depending on each and every circumstance, that vulnerability and that resilience could be could look very different to, to each person. So great advice. Thanks so much for sharing that. For a long time, you've been advocating to reframe the concept of work and especially the concept of work-life balance. Do you want to talk to me a little bit about that concept? Nadia, I don't really believe that there is such a thing as balance. <laughs> uh, the truth is that there will be days when we have a deadline at work, when our focus has to be there. There will be days when we have a sick child um, or our child has a big project, they need help, when we'll focus on that. So um, at Thrive, we used to call it work-life integration. And now um, we change that to be life-work integration. That's fantastic. Because part of what we've learned during the pandemic is that work should not dominate our lives the way it has done for so many of us for so many years. That, in fact, work um, needs to be part of our life. And uh, we can still do amazing work. In fact, better and more sustainable work when we are really um, recognizing uh, that the rest of our lives, the time we take to recharge, to find joy in our relationships, in our hobbies, whatever we love to do, actually makes us more productive sustainably uh, at work. Amazing. This is such great advice even for companies, right? that integrating your work into your life instead of doing it the other way around. I absolutely love that. Thank you for sharing that great piece of advice. Obviously, you know, founders and executives play a very key role in developing a supportive culture. Do you have any advice and, and you know, if you think about the prioritization on mental health they need to bring to work? It can be very, very different company to company. So tell me a bit about where leadership plays, plays this crucial role into the space as well. So as you know, Nadia, um, the mental health crisis has been dramatically exacerbated by the pandemic. It, it was there before the pandemic, uh, but the pandemic has made um, increases in depression and anxiety um, overwhelming. So I feel it's really important not just to deal with employees who are depressed or anxious, but to give them tools to prevent it. And we actually worked with Stanford uh, to bring forward the latest um, brain research and, uh, and show that if we understand our biotypes, our stress types, what triggers us, we can bring in tools and support in, this, in the form of these micro steps to prevent um, worry or rumination or anything we are going through from becoming anxiety or depression. I mean, let me give you an example. There are eight biotypes, eight stress types. Mine is rumination. So if there's anybody listening who's a ruminator, you will understand. I, I tend to be very hard on myself. If I make a mistake, I tend to ruminate over it, to beat myself up over it. Um, in fact, I call this voice in my head the obnoxious roommate living in my head. <laughs> I love and that. And it's exhausting, it's draining, yeah. and it's not productive. 
No. So when I identify that in myself, I can bring humor in dealing with it. I can bring perspective. So it doesn't take me over. And there are many, many other um, biotypes that you may identify with more than rumination, but then you create like a support system uh, to prevent this from taking over. I mean, I have quotes, for example, around me here on my desk. I I have a quote from Montaigne, the French philosopher who said, there were many terrible things in my life, but most of them never happened. Yeah, I'm totally going to take that away and add some beautiful quotes to my desk. I think it's a great way to stay centered. And I love the humor piece. I think that does bring a completely different perspective into someone's day, even and into your own day. Um, So thanks so much for sharing that. Pivoting a little bit from this, a lot of, I mean, there's such amazing unicorn tech startups all over the world right now. And most of them are following this you know, new way of work and these distributed models. And with all these innovative solutions comes very interesting challenges. How can we all juggle the need for short-term success combined with that long-term perseverance in order to succeed? And more specifically in the workplace during these hyper-growing or startup type organizations? Well, actually, it's really important to recognize that to have sustainable growth, we need to see um, well-being and productivity connected. There is no trade-off between the two, but that requires a big cultural change. Because for many decades, um, we all thought that the way to be really successful and do great work was to power through exhaustion. I mean, people would brag about how little sleep they got. I mean, we had John Bon Jovi singing, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And now we have tons of science that shows that when we're exhausted and burned out, we are less productive, less creative, more likely to make mistakes and more likely to show up as the worst version of ourselves. No, that's absolutely spot on. And also this hustle culture, as you said, like that, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead type culture, certainly something that was installed, I nearly want to say from the 90s onwards, right? And I'm so happy to hear that voice in terms of breaking that need to burn out and just continue working until you absolutely can't anymore. And that obviously leads to all these other side effects. Yeah, it actually goes back even before. Frankly, in my work, and I've written two books on that, Thrive and the Sleep Revolution, and in my work, I found that it goes back to the first industrial revolution when we started revering machines and after machines software. And the goal with machines and software is to minimize downtime. Yeah. Uh, but for the human operating system, downtime is not a bug, it's a feature. And when we remember that, we realize that we need it in order to be the most productive, creative and empathetic versions of ourselves. Amazing. Thanks for sharing, Ariana. So from this, you know, pivoting a little bit from juggling the short term success with sustainable future, the fail fast mantra that is quite systematic in the widespread tech industry, is that still something that you live by? You know, this is changing. The idea of um, move fast and break things, you know, the Facebook motto, they even changed it. They just issued new cultural values, moving beyond that. You know, the idea that, um, You fail fast, that's fine. But the breaking things along the way, that's not fine. Uh, I think recognizing that failure is part of success, I think is very important. In fact, my my mother uh, brought me up on the saying, failure is not the opposite of success. It's a stepping stone to success. Because if we're afraid to fail, uh, we are afraid to take risks. And uh, we are afraid to dream big. 
but at the same time, it's really important um, to recognize that there are consequences um, when, when there are unintended consequences to our actions. And, you know, when I was on the board of Uber, we saw firsthand uh, how uh, having a culture that's fueled by burnout um, affects business results. Absolutely. And that's what the world has recognized. And that's why we are at this very exciting moment, Nadia, when we really have a once in a generation opportunity to redefine how we uh, work and live and uh, to leave behind us a lot of outdated and frankly unscientific notions of, uh, of success that's not sustainable. Is there a way to teach others that failure is part of success and take that fear away? Oh, absolutely. I think it's happening. And people are looking around and seeing um, a lot of fundamental changes, like with everything. Some companies and some individuals are ahead of others. Um, but we are moving in a world where people are not afraid to discuss mental health challenges, where they are less afraid to take time for themselves and know that this will make them more productive. And where we are also seeing that um, it's not just work uh, that can lead to burnout, it's also habits that we have outside of work, like a growing addiction to social media or games or doom scrolling down news feeds. So learning to set boundaries to technology and our use of technology um, is incredibly important. And it's another tool that we believe needs to be given um, to employees to use both at work and outside of work. And especially now that um, the, the lines have blurred between the two, it's more important than ever. We're rapidly running out of time. So I'd love to end with this one important question that I know you always have great advice for. How can we all find more meaning in our daily work and lives? Well, I love that question. Um, because that's really at the heart of everything. Um, in uh, my book, Thrive, I talk about how in our lives at the moment, a lot of us think that success means just more money and more status slash power. But in fact, finding meaning in what we are doing and um, making sure that we allow ourselves time to and experience the wonder and the beauty of life, have time to give back, all these things uh, make our lives much more meaningful and much more joyful. And Nadia, I find that incredibly important that of course we all want to be productive and successful, but also finding joy in what we're doing um, is key. And purpose is a great, um, a great part of uh, this journey if we want to have a meaningful and joyful life. Thank you so much, Ariana. That was absolutely the perfect way to end this amazing conversation and what great advice you shared there. We thoroughly enjoyed all your thoughtful comments and amazing advice today. Thanks again for joining us at Remote Connect. And for all of you in the audience, I would absolutely urge you to go and visit thriveglobal.com and sign up for Ariana's On My Mind monthly newsletter. There's such great advice in there every single month. And some of you might be very active on Twitter or Instagram. I would encourage you to go follow Ariana's journey along and get some great weekly nuggets of amazing advice and motivation. Thanks so much, Ariana. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Nadia. That was wonderful. Thank you.